it's it's actually, second. Hold on. Sorry. It's still Logan. Sorry. One second. Facebook takes a minute. Telling you a lie. Go. Hey. Welcome, everybody. Hey, it is the virtual reality. Welcome to this special edition of St. Laz Live, live episode with uh, Rudy Jambal, who is from Broward College, professor of African American history, and also dean of students, even if it's on a temporary basis, Rudy. Uh, but here today, we're talking about the significance of Juneteenth, right? And so we couldn't think of any other person who could make this conversation come alive, teach us a thing of two, and have our viewers really reflect on the, the, this entire package, this Juneteenth package. So Rudy, let me welcome you again. Thank you for joining us. I would love for you to just say a little something about yourself, your background, and what you do at Broward College, just in case. I sure, need absolutely. Uh, so I've been at Broward College for now 12 and a half years. Um, and so I started as an adjunct professor. Now I'm then a full-time professor of African-American history and American history. Uh, and now I'm the interim associate dean of the criminal justice department there. Uh, and then also I am the chair of the college's advisory council for the advancement of diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. Oh, you, you, you have a full load. You have a full load. Right? <laughs> that I do. <laughs> and so all, of, all the more reason why you're just the perfect person to help us talk about Juneteenth, right? And so the, the title of our, of our conversation today is Why Juneteenth, right? And so we know that President Biden signed, I think, yesterday or was it earlier today? Yesterday, this, yesterday. This, the, this proclamation designating Juneteenth as a federal holiday. We know that since the murder of George Floyd, there's been heightened awareness around the African-American experience. So many more people are talking about Juneteenth. People are curious about it. And so let's, let's put it in context. So Let's let's begin with you trying to answer why Juneteenth. Right. And so what's the significance? Absolutely. So, you know, the Civil War really brought slavery to an end. Um, so people think that it's the Emancipation Proclamation, but really it was Abraham Lincoln doing really political chess, right? The Emancipation Proclamation didn't fully bring slavery to an end. Um, but the Civil War did. And so on April 9th, 1865, you have the South you know, acquiescing and, you know, admitting that the North pretty much had gained victory. Uh, but even though that was the case and that happened in April of 1865, there were still slaves that did not know that slavery had come to an end. Um, in particular, there were slaves in Texas. And so on June 19th, 1865 in Galveston, Texas, uh, a general order was made to let those slaves know that slavery had indeed come to an end. And I think the fact that Juneteenth is being celebrated really speaks to the collectiveness of the Black experience. Um, I like to say that I believe in Pan-Africanism, so I'm of Haitian descent. Um, I'm very proud of my, my heritage, uh, but I also recognize that all of us have African blood in us. Um, and so I think what it speaks to, if we look at the African context, we're very communal people by nature. We see this in our get togethers, right? And so what you have is acknowledgement that we're not all free until all of us are free. And so the fact that there is this celebration around Juneteenth speaks to the fact that even though there were slaves that were aware that slavery was over in April of 1865, the fact that you had these slaves in Texas that didn't get informed until June 1865 really is the marker of a sense of independence and liberation. And so to celebrate Juneteenth is to celebrate togetherness and to celebrate the fact that we're all free uh, or we're free when all of us are free. And, and, and so I, I'm so glad that you really gave us a, a quick history lesson around the date of the proclamation. But then the proclamation is signed in April, but the, pro, the official proclamation is January 1st, right? January 1st, uh, uh, 1866, I would imagine, right? And yeah. then, of course, the, the enslaved in Texas don't hear about it till maybe two years 
later, right? And so well, that's how it's often framed. And part of it, the reason why it's framed like that is, is because America wants to create revisionist history to make Abraham Lincoln seem as like the savior of black people. And it doesn't mean that Abraham Lincoln didn't make his contributions, right? But when he had the Emancipation Proclamation, you're right, January 1st, 1863, there's some things to consider. First, he had a preliminary Emancipation Proclamation in September of 1862. And in that, he's suggesting to the South, if you rejoin us, you can have your slaves, right? Abraham Lincoln actually wanted to expel all of Black people from America because he didn't think that Blacks and whites could coexist. And so he really is just using the Emancipation Proclamation as a political chess move, but he had no power because the Union was still in war in the South. And so really when you're looking at the 13th Amendment, which is ratified in January of 1865, and then the ending of the Civil War in April of 1865, that's really what's going to bring slavery to an end. And then you have it two months later, where in Texas, they do, it, they do get the news that slavery is over. And so in the African-American communities throughout the United States, Juneteenth is a significant a historical marker, right? It is known as Freedom Day, Emancipation Day, <laughs> Ju Black Jubilee, so on and so forth, right? And so and, and from your view, uh, this holiday, how, how should we, how should we, how should we take that? How should we? How should we take this holiday? I, I think I think the holiday, though it's nice, it doesn't supplant or take away the need for continual fighting for progress, right? And I think one of the things I want us to be very mindful of is to not allow for momentary wins or little wins to deter us from the fact that there are much greater wins, right? Um, it, you know, what brings into mind is even Martin Luther King Day. Um, it's, it's interesting. So we know that King Day really becomes a holiday in the early 1980s. Um, but the thing I often think about is Martin Luther King's legacy is not just civil rights, right? He was also very much anti-poverty with his, you know, poor people campaign. And yet when we look at Martin Luther King Boulevard in various cities, including Miami, which is on 62nd Street, there's a lot of poverty that exists and part of it is because of systemic issues. And so just because we have Martin Luther King Day doesn't really mean that the integrity of, his, of, of who he was is truly being celebrated. Uh, we you know, say the I have a dream speech and it's only the, the part about black boys and black girls holding hands with white girls and, and white boys. But really that first part of the speech is really calling out America for its economic hypocrisy. The fact that you are this wealthy nation, but yet you are not giving or making sure there's a system in place for a lot of Black people to be a part of this economic enterprise. And so I can easily see us celebrating Juneteenth, but not living the, the actual desire to have Black people truly be free. So I think for me, Juneteenth should be celebrated in where we support Black businesses. Uh, Juneteenth is, should be celebrated in which we are gathering with other Black folk, whether we're African-Americans, but also those of us of the Caribbean descent. Juneteenth is about loving our African roots and also bringing into thought, how do we create true freedom for our people? I think those are the ideal ways to celebrate Juneteenth. I'm glad you say that because again, since George Floyd's murder, I know that our commitment at Santla has been to ensure that these conversations are taking place in the heart of Black communities, whether it's Haitian American or other Caribbean communities, right? Where we sometimes don't have similar experiences. We have similar experiences, but sometimes not so similar. And so at times we can view certain issues as not necessarily pertinent to us or not relevant to our experience. And so for us, this idea that we should be talking about all of these issues that impact us just as much as they do other, other Black people, other Black and Brown people throughout the United States. So for us, that's important, right? And so uh, from your view, as someone who is of, of Haitian descent, someone who is, you're an historian, so you, you care about this, history excites you, you are interested in ensuring that 
successive generations understand the forces that have shaped who we are, right? So what do you say to Haitian Americans in terms of making sure that they understand what this date represents, maybe in relationship to our own January 1st? Absolutely. I think you hit it right on the head as far as that connection to our independence, right? And I think one of the things that we have to be mindful of is that for so long, African Americans saw Haitians, and especially when it comes to Haitian independence, as a light, right? Uh, it was served as a light to encourage others to uh, fight for their independence, to run away from plantations, to really question whether or not they really want to deal with slavery um, for an extended period of time. And so much so that even the one of the authors of Lift Every Voice and Sing, James Weldon Johnson is from Florida. And many people don't know this, his grandmother is actually Haitian, right? And so there's definitely a connection between the two sides. Uh, and so what we recognize is that we are stronger as a people ethnically when we look at things through a lens of the whole African experience and not just our own experience. Um, because there were African Americans who played a significant role in the Haitian refugee movement as well, right? It wasn't just an isolated experience. Um, and in many ways, there are many times where Haitians played a pivotal role in the lives of African Americans. Um, and so when we've gotten away from that, and there's some dynamics around that, you know, I think about locally, especially in Miami in the 80s and the disconnect between the two, the two uh, ethnicities, we suffer, both sides suffer because of that. And so we are stronger and better together. And so if we're having African-American friends, you know, enjoy and embrace our independence and love their subjumu and they want to be a part of that, I think it's only right that we really kind of have a deeper understanding of Juneteenth and really celebrate this moment with our African-American brothers and sisters as well. Absolutely. And, and it's so ironic that uh, a country such as Haiti, which was so widely admired and continues to be admired by Black people across this globe, right? Haiti, which was this beacon of hope, of light, of Blackness for so many people of color in this country, Black people in particular, right? Haiti, which was the place, the, the inspiration, right, for so many movements around Black liberation movements, around the Harlem Renaissance, and so many other movements that shaped the Black experience. So what I'm finding as the greatest irony is that we, we, we don't know this mutual history or this mutual legacy or heritage that we share. That's, that, that's, such, a, that's such an irony. We need, what do we do about this? It is. I think one of the things that we have to, to realize is the way in which oppression works. Oppression works through the lens of division, right? And so when we're looking at what white Americans did, or really whiteness in general, right, from a global context, and Europeans especially in general, there, there were ways in which to create division. There was a creation of a racial caste system. And so uh, I don't think it's an accident that many of our Arab brothers and sisters, there are those who appreciate those who are Black, but then there are those who, who don't. There are many Latin brothers and sisters who appreciate Black folk, and then there are those who don't, right? And we know this to be the case as an example of even the Irish going way back then, where they were despised by the British and therefore despised by white Americans but the way in which they were able to ingratiate themselves to whiteness was by hating blacks, right? And so quite often people do this for a position of power. And I often remind folk that if a police officer stops you, they're not gonna to take time to ask, are you Haitian? Are you Jamaican? <laughs> are you African-American? They're just gonna look at your complexion and just think to themselves that you're black, right? Um, you know, for every, George Floyd, there also is an Abner Luima, right? And so we have to really- Abadou Diallo. Abadou yes. Diallo, right? Absolutely. And so we have to really critically think about how the thing that allowed for us to be oppressed was division. And so the only thing that can really get us out of any sense of oppression and disconnect is togetherness. Mm -hmm. So Moody, uh, you've got quite a heavy load at Broward College, right? You, you, you just said it, you're wearing a number of significant hats, significant in general, but significant in the moment as well. So what, what are you prioritizing 
in terms of your professional, your, that professional side of you, that, that, that the professor, the, the, the college, the, the historian, that person who's shaping and molding the worldview of so many students, whether black, white, or whatever? That's a really good question. I, I feel like my, my, my goals, my aim when it comes to the academic world is always consistent and that I always want for my students to be better than they were before they encountered me. Uh, and so even in an administrative role, right? Now, I went from being a professor to now overseeing professors, right? And so now it's about empowering my professors with all the tools that they need in order to help their students succeed. It's about creating programming that is going to help with employability skills. So one of the things that I did in my role um, is we launched a colloquium that exposes them to uh, people in the criminal justice field that will eventually expose them to resume building, interviewing skills, uh, and the gamut. Um, we actually ended the spring semester with a panel that featured Broward County's public defender, state's attorney, supervisor of election, and undershare who all happen to be black, right? And so that kind of level of programming speaks to the fact that I really want my students to be seen. Um, and I use that term because I had a student who said as a black woman, she had never felt so seen in a class before. And that really stuck with me, right? Because I think- What you mean by that? I think what she meant was the fact that quite often as being a black woman, she enters into a class that doesn't acknowledge the contributions, the value of black women, that doesn't acknowledge some of the marginalizations and pain that black women endure. And for me, I've always made it a business to really be mindful of how Black women have contributed to history, right? And in that particular moment she was referencing is, it was the day after um, the, it was determined by the Attorney General of, of Kentucky, Cameron, to not prosecute police officers for the murder of Breonna Taylor. And many professors in that instance just don't approach that topic at all. Uh, maybe fearful of it being deemed as too political. Um, but I saw it as my responsibility for us to dialogue about it in the class and to just give my students space to speak their minds around it. Um, and that moment for her was just, she felt really seen. And, you know, just the other day, I had an opportunity to be a part of this online course um, by AQ, which is the Association of College University Educators where they interviewed me for their course to be one of the faculty experts. So they find different professors throughout the country who are doing some amazing things in the classroom and really to help professors throughout the country kind of share what they do in the classroom. And I was fortunate enough to be selected. And one of the things that um, occurred was they interviewed my students and she was one of the individuals that they interviewed. And, and that's what she also articulated again, that i made her feel seen. And I think that's such a very powerful thing. And that's that's always my aim in that in that realm. Yeah, you most definitely, most definitely should keep that up. And so as you as you reflect on this experience and the impact that you had on this one student, what's your view of this conversation that we're having in Florida, this shameful conversation around critical race theory, right? And uh, you know, to the extent that the governor of the state, the state board of education, are suggesting that you know, we should not, they're, 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 they're weaponizing this framework of, right. of understanding history, of teaching history, and suggesting that we're creating, we're sowing the vision. What's your view? So the desire to ban critical race theory actually affirms critical race theory, right? And so yeah. one of the things <laughs> that we have to realize is that there is, it is, it is anti-American, not just from a freedom of speech perspective. But when we think about America, I think it's so interesting that to be American quite often, people say it is to give your best, it is to progress, it is to go after this American dream, the idea that you can go from one part of the socioeconomic ladder to another. And yet, for some reason in this country, the area in which there seems to be a lack of desire to progress is when it comes to matters of race, right? And if we're honest about it, I think there's several issues at play. Number one, if we were to really address race and if we were to really create an environment in a nation of equity and equality, 
now you're bringing more competition that had not existed for many of our white counterparts, right? And there isn't a desire to do that. The other thing is that people don't like to feel guilty. Um, and my thing is this, if you wanna be my enemy, so be it, just be honest about it, right? Don't suggest that it is um, too political or too divisive. Don't say in one breath, and that's one of the things that the governor had done, right? Is one breath say that conservatives should not be banned from social media and literally creating legislation that says, we're going to find social mediums that happen to ban conservative voices, but then in the same breath, also allow for individuals to really act like vigilantes and to assume and make judgments upon certain protesters, right? So you can't do both of those things. I would rather someone just say, be honest and say, uh, I don't care for black people. Your liberation is a threat to me. And therefore I want to maintain status quo. And at least you're honest about it, right? Yeah. And I think that to me is the greatest issue is the lack of honesty of the hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah. And if, if that honesty, well, we're gonna leave that alone for a minute and 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 move on to the black experience, right? The the the, the black immigrant experience in these United States, and and here since we're from South Florida, we're talking about what we're seeing unfold in our own backyard, right? Yes. So from your, from your historical perch, right? Um, how, do you, how do you see us working to improve um, relationships, right? Uh, improve inter-group, inter inter-ethnic relations such that we can, you know, we, we can do some of the work of healing between us, among us, for ourselves. How do you yeah. how do you see what do you what do you recommend we do to get us to set us firmly on that path and on a path towards success towards taking care of ourselves in that way? I think I think empowering young people because young people are not as caught up on ethnic differences, right? True. This and is so, true. And so I think empowering young people to think about formalizing a structure around this unity. Um, there's a lot of young people that don't really fully understand the disconnects that have existed for so long within the various ethnic differences in, in the Black experience. And I think so once we have that kind of conversation that says, hey, you're Haitian and you're seem to be really good friends with this Jamaican, who seems to be really good friends with this African-American, who seems to be really good friends with this Afro-Cuban, that you all should not just take this lightly as a thing of a friendship, but really form a group around that where you get to experience each other's differences and then unite around each other's differences, right? And so I think when we get young people who are already open-minded to the differences and really focus more so on connection, I think saying to them, hey, let's create a structure around this connection, whether it be student organization, uh, whether it be a professional organization, where we can fully address some of the elephants in the room with the intention of healing rather than separation, I think that's a really good start. I think the other thing is also thinking about it through a, a lens of economic empowerment. And so what happens quite often as Black folk and then as Haitians or African-Americans or whatever the case may be, we get very hyper-focused on serving our communities from a business standpoint. And in doing such, I think there's, there's good in that and there's power in that but it's also limiting our revenue dollars, right? And so what does it look like for Haitian restaurants to say, we're not only here, of course, to serve our Haitian people, but also maybe hold space for an African-American meeting, right? And so that is engendering some African-American dollars coming in and really kind of sharing that. What would it look like if a Caribbean restaurant had a Juneteenth celebration? What would it look like for a soul food restaurant to have something on January 1st where they're highlighting Haitian independence. I think there's some economic potential around getting together as well that should be talked about a lot more. I agree with you when you say that young people uh, are the salvation here because already they're demonstrating to us day in and day out that they have the, the, the power and the capabilities to come together, to be together, to share space, whole space for difficult conversations. Right. And so we're just hoping that we can provide them with additional tools 
additional spaces and additional support so that they can probably break down barriers that my generation was unable to and 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 certainly yours as well so speaking of speaking of you know these young people who really you know on, on whom we're counting today to continue to break down these barriers of division barriers of you know i'm i'm so and so you're different from me or you're not black you're not you're not you're not african american you're haitian and all of that stuff tell me how how do you feel as a an african american of haitian descent how do you feel when you hear these kinds of comments whether and sometimes they come from young people and right. they also come from older generations i think that we have to be honest about how poisonous exclusion is and how that level of exclusion can actually create the opposite effect, right? Do we understand, do we understand the form of this exclusion or the forms that exclusion takes? There is no full understanding because if I think there was, I don't think it would exist, right? I think people would be more mindful. So I think about the fact that there are Haitians as an example, um, Haitians who, who speak well, but the, the accent isn't the greatest, and they go to Haiti and they're referred to as Mumbala, right? And so that's a form of exclusion, even though that might not be the intent. And I think it does the opposite effect, right? It doesn't bring someone in. It actually makes someone feel like they're not accepted. Um, and, and so therefore that kind of level of exclusion generates uh, a desire to not embrace, but actually run away. Um, I think about the fact that there were instances where uh, even in the neighborhood that I grew up in, I grew up in a predominantly Black neighborhood for the first 17 years of my life. And I remember telling my friends one time something I learned from school and them calling me white, even though I didn't say it in the King's English, I said it in the way the neighborhood spoke. But for them, the fact that I mentioned something about school suggested I wasn't Black, right? And so those moments are extremely hurtful. And I think when we are excluding anyone from our race or our ethnicity, I think we're losing a sense of value. And so one of the things I think about as an example is, you know, there's this uncomfortable truth that there were some Africans who sold other Africans into slavery, right? And so when we look at it from that standpoint, and we know that some estimates have about 12 and a half million slaves uh, being brought from Africa to the Americas, Think about all the genius that left Africa through that alone, right? And so let's remember, and, let's remember Rudy, that Africans were not the only ones selling uh, fellow Africans, right? So true. that 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 trade and human beings was pretty widespread. Right? Very true, very true. And so therefore, you think about all the genius that was leaving Africa. Think about all the children that were not born in Africa but in the Americas that could have added significant value. And so anytime we are excluding members of our race or our ethnicity, we're also excluding value from ourselves as well. And that has to be taken into consideration. And this, this slogan of ours, right? And unity, their strength, that, 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 that as you say this, it comes to mind because it, again, it reminds me that we collectively will make limited progress until we really do come together. Right, and so I think you know uh, George the George Floyd's legacy is is it seems to me to be about providing an opportunity to have us you know come together, have us come together, understand one another, understand our common history, understand our shared history, understand our shared pains, understand our shared uh, challenges, right, and and understand our shared aspirations as well and set about uh, the ways in which we're gonna build this future that, that we all envision, a future in which you know, we thrive, a future in which we thrive, but we, we have got some work to do as well in terms Absolutely. of teaching one another, sharing with one another, and, and, and you know, having those difficult conversations or painful conversations, right? Absolutely. So in that vein, what, what are the books you would you know, a couple of books. I know you could probably we could spend the rest of this time you with you sharing some of you know some of your favorites. But the question is, what are what are the important books that you would recommend 
uh, that people read right now, especially those who are truly interested in understanding the African-American experience in this country and, and globally, right? Black people globally, people right. who really want to build bridges, people who want to, in fact, understand, you know, the impact of enslavement and, and, and its relics today, it's, it's, it's it, what it's left us, its legacies, right? Then from economic to educational to health, et cetera. So there are people working in this space who want to dismantle some of these structures, the systemic uh, structures. Some people want to improve conditions, but they can't always do so without understanding the, the context, the full context. Right, right. right. So I, I, when you I think to understand the full context, people have often talked about Ibrahim Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist uh, but his work before that, stamped from the beginning, I think is really critical and important. Um, and I think it's important because it really gives insight on a racial structure, right? And how this narrative around race is created and crafted, because people need to understand that race is a pseudoscience, right? It is a characterization of a people. And so therefore, if we assume that black or white is what determines someone's character, and then there's a whole narrative and thinking behind that, um, then we allow for a lot of disparities to exist. And so Ibram Kendi's, you know, how, um, not how to be anti-racist, but rather stamp from the beginning, I think is a critical book uh, to really begin uh, to take a deeper dive. Um, the other book I would recommend is Isabel Wilkerson's uh, the cast. And I think that not that the book in and of itself is the greatest book of all time, but I think it's important because her comparisons from to America to India, I think is warranted in that what you're looking at when it comes to racism is an establishment of a caste system, right? So there's a reason why white people are so angry right now. Um, it's not, it's one thing to say, all right, you know, black people, I guess we got to stop with police brutality and inequities and okay, let's work towards it. But no, there's a visceral anger from many whites. And I think understanding, you know, or reading that book can give a deeper understanding as to why that exists. So I think those are the two books that can give some really good context of how we got here. And to really, you know, start formalizing some strategies on how we get out of the situation. I know that you are very much into book clubs, right? In, in fact, I think you, you run I think you had one right now. Yeah. So is this is this a a frame or a, a process or a space that you recommend that more of us take an opportunity to 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 engage in? You know, maybe the, decide on which books we want to read collectively and have a great read, if you will, right? A yeah. community great read. So the, the greatest thing about a book club uh, for me, and I just want to give a shout out to anyone who is from the South Florida Marathon Book Club, um, Black men, and um, is the people that you meet, right? And so you're having these powerful conversations, but then you're also meeting some really great minds who can offer a perspective that you didn't think of before. And I think that to me is the power of the book club. And I think there is something to be said about books. Um, the most important thing, you know, for me, is really reading. Um, so I have a four-year-old who'll be five uh, soon, and I'm proud to say he reads at like a really second, third, fourth grade level, right? And so reading is very foundational and important to him, and really for me as his father, because I knew that it, once he's able to read, the world is his oyster, right? He can go and do various things. Um, and creates a new level of curiosity for him. Um, and funny enough, just the other day, uh, one of his teachers wrote a book called Haiti and Her Friends. And it deals with the Haitian Revolution and it deals with how they were brought from Africa, but how they fought for independence. It deals with uh, Haiti's contributions to Latin America and Greece and X, Y, and Z. And my son is reading this to me, right? And so I don't have to tell him merely about this. He's reading it for himself. And that's a, a really big difference in his development. And so I think reading is important in any aspect. And to have dialogue around it is definitely instrumental. Let me tell you, I am, I am so sorry that we were unable to take 
comments or questions from our viewers right now. It, it's okay. We, we, we'll make it work. We'll, I'll try to maybe guess what it is that they would want to ask you, right? And so, uh, again, let's go back to Broward College, right? So you're not in the classroom so much, but you're in a position to influence other professors, right? So given your role now uh, as leading this, 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 you know, equity and, and inclusion kind of framework for your for your colleagues. What's your big what's your biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is I walk into a building, right, um, where there are many police officers. Uh, and so in the Institute of Public Safety, which is the pathway that criminal justice falls under, there are three components. There's a police academy. There is the professional and executive development side. Um, and so what they do is they help train police after the academy. So those who are part of agencies and are you know, fully full-fledged law enforcement officers. Um, and saying I, that these, these, and these entities are near where you work is, is what you're saying. We literally work together. We're all a part of the same department, right? Uh, and so, and I have to give them credit as far as the associate dean. So there's three associate deans and there's one dean in this area. Um, and so I work well with the person who oversees the police academy. And I really work well with the person who oversees professional and executive development. Um, the, the challenge is I know that many of the officers, right? And granted, I don't have to necessarily interact with them or work with them on a regular basis, but I see them every single day. Um, that they may have a viewpoint just based upon who I am and how I look that I may be against them, right? And so some of our professors or many of my professors are former law enforcement officers, right? Um, you have some students who may want to be in law enforcement. And so the thing is not to discourage them from being a part of that because we need people in law enforcement who are about caring justice in a real way. We need more law enforcement officers who don't have the bias uh, we need more law officers, law enforcement officers who are going to be of integrity. And so really the challenge is just making sure that I'm able to stand in my truth, right? That I am someone who is for justice. Um, I'm someone for, for racial equity. Um, and then I'm giving my professor the tools to acknowledge these things and not run away from these things. Uh, and to their credit, um, they've embraced me. Uh, my faculty have. And so that's really, really good, right? Um, there's also this age aspect because I'm in my 30s, right? I'm a young <laughs> black woman of this department, right? And so therefore, um, but to their credit, because of their background of law enforcement and um, the way in which law enforcement or the military, as an example, sees this aspect of authority, they're very respectful. It's always Dean Jabbar and this, that, and the third. And so that's, that's appreciative. Uh, and they see my passion, right? And they can appreciate that. And they can appreciate that I want to bring our program to the next level. Um, and so that's the main challenge though, is getting them to a place where they're comfortable, right? They're not on too com completely uncomfortable, but they're acknowledging some of these inequities and they're talking about it in the classroom. I think that's the challenge I would definitely want to overcome. Excellent. And so say something about their ethnicities, because I think you mentioned that they were younger, older, or various age groups. What about ethnically? How diverse yeah. are they? Uh, so it's, it's a diverse group. Um, and so I have full-time faculty, and then I have a lot of adjunct faculty. Uh, and so there's a good mix of those who are Black, uh, those who are white. Um, and, and really, there are also um, someone who's of Latin origin as well. Um, but I think there's more room really to scale more folk of Latin origin, to be honest. Uh, the other thing that I'm excited about is the potential of, of many us finding maybe more women as well. So I have 20 or so faculty that I oversee, uh, but only five of whom happen to be women. And what the data is showing is that more of our students are, are female, right? And so even within criminal justice. So that colloquium series I had mentioned before, our first colloquium event actually was in honor of Women's History Month. Uh, and it was a dynamic panel that featured women from the first captain uh, of uh, Pembroke Pines Police Agency, a BSO captain, assistant state attorney, and then also an executive director of um, Florida Children's First. I wanna say that's the name of that nonprofit. Uh, and so therefore I also wanna acknowledge 
that we want to empower women to be members of the criminal justice field. And I think seeing that reflection in the classroom is going to be critical as well. So those are some things I'm looking at uh, deeply. So uh, some of our viewers want us to go back to the history of Juneteenth, right? And so I know that as we started, you you laid out for us historical facts, you know, uh, and so I don't know if maybe we should repeat just in case sure. someone may have missed it. But then Absolutely. we're gonna we're gonna build from what Juneteenth actually is to maybe again reminding people of of its legacy, right, and how that legacy touches us today and what our role is and furthering it. So Absolutely. Juneteenth. Absolutely. So Juneteenth is when a general order number three in Galveston, Texas had been decreed um, to indicate to the slaves in Texas and really all of Texas that slavery in America had come to an end. Um, and the need for that decree was the fact that you still had slaves in Texas who didn't know that slavery had come to an end, uh, even though it had really come to an end a couple of months prior to with the ending of the Civil War. Um, and again, I, when I think about Juneteenth and its legacy, I think it speaks to the spirit of those of us who are of African descent, right? And that's all of us, those who are Haitian, Jamaican, African-American, you know, you name it, that we are people of, we are communal and community-based people, right? And so I think the celebration speaks to the fact that even though there were slaves or formerly enslaved individuals, who knew slavery was over and had already experienced independence and had met with their families and reconnected, that the notion of we're not free until all of us are free. And I think that that's very, very true. And so that's what this day is about. Um, it's about acknowledging that we need to move forward as a people together. Uh, and that's what Juneteenth is to me. You know, what does it say to you that uh, in, our, in our Congress in 2021, that there would be 14 Republicans who vote against this, making this a national holiday? I think that when we talk about slavery, I think we need to be honest about how many politicians are slaves to vote, right? And so if their constituents essentially suggest we don't want that, then they'll do it, right? And so I think mean, that's the, the thing that I think about that is unfortunate about where we are as a country. And, and I'm saying this, not as someone who is the biggest fan of, of any political party, to be honest with you, but I'm saying that because it seems as though people are more interested in status than they are integrity. What do they truly believe and how do they get to that place? I think the other thing that we need to take, take a deeper look um, at is what does it mean to be American? And I think a lot of people, if we're honest about it, including members of Congress, equate whiteness to Americanness, right? Um, and that's spoken in the fact that people are so anti not only critical race theory, but the, the teaching and discussion around 1619 Project. So even if someone were to have, for example, um, issue with the scholarship of the 1619 Project, and that's perfectly fine, right? Um, but to uh, say that you're not going to allow for that to be discussed in classrooms is really not only anti-democratic, but it's anti-intellectualism, right? Because the idea is not to always agree on things. Our scholarship is not always going to agree on how we got to this answer, right? And so when we look at the 1619 Project, which espouses that slavery was foundational to America's fight for independence, right? And it's critique that says, no, that, that, that's not true, that's fine. But what we cannot deny is that slavery is foundational to the existence of America, right? And so now the debate will become, well, how, what role does slavery play in America's independence? That's an interesting dialogue to have. That's way better than just saying, you can't teach this here, right? Or to deny Nicole Hannah Jones tenure at University of North Carolina, right? That's not only anti-democratic, it's anti-scholar scholarship. And I think that's the part that is problematic. Sobering, eh? sobering that while at, the, at, at, at a time when we're seeing and we're happy that there's such renewed interest and, in, well, from some people, uh, renewed interest in, in the Black experience in the United States from enslavement up till today, you know, there are still those forces that, that, that don't want to face, that, that, that don't want to encourage this interest because I think they don't want to face their, they don't want to face the truth either. And, and I think you said you said it very clearly earlier. And so we, we're going to leave that alone and just build on this moment and look at what our roles are today 
you laid out a number of things that we, we should encourage that promote uh, alliances, alliance building, that, promotes, that promote togetherness, that promote uh, renewing our shared, our shared experiences, our shared aspirations uh, along those lines. And so uh, I want us to close out with you again, just telling our Facebook audience, um, you know, what they should do, you know, to, to play their part, their small part, their individual part and in furthering the legacy of Juneteenth. I, I think for me, you know, and, and we were a part of a, another conversation recently, I, I go back to it's so important that people have a true love for black people and within not only their ethnicities, but just all black people as a whole, right? And what that looks at is it says, I'm thinking about even my own success in relationship to the success of others, right? Um, you know, there's a great quote, and I was sharing this today. I had a, a presentation for the equity conference for Broward County Public Schools. And one of the quotes that I shared was, is a great quote that says, on someone's headstone, how many hopes lied buried here, right? How many hopes lied buried here? And to live a life in which you're helping people realize their hopes and dreams so that they don't die with these hopes and dreams, I think makes all the difference in the world. And so that takes deep sacrifice. And that deep sacrifice can only be birthed out of love, right? And so Cornell West says, that love is what justice looks like in public. And I believe that wholeheartedly, right? And so to be just is to really first love. And if you love people, um, then I think that's where the difference can be made. Okay, that, that is so well said, so well said. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, for your insights. Thank you for what you do. Keep on keeping on. Uh, you know, we, you have a lot of people who are rooting for you, wait, rooting for Rudy, uh, waiting to see what else you're going to do in such, at such a tender age. But you certainly are a role model. You are, you're an example and you're an inspiration. So thank you for your time today. Thanks for your insights. Thank you for sharing. Right. Thank you. I just want to thank you for um, you being you as well and being a legend uh, and an inspiration yourself. And um, it's an honor to be in your presence always. So really appreciate this moment in time. Thank you too. And we know that our viewers are going to, we're going to see their, their comments as we end this conversation, but I know that everyone took quite a bit away from, from much of what you had to say. So thank you again. And until, um, not necessarily the next Juneteenth, but uh, well, we should create more opportunities like this to learn and share and promote precisely what you describe as, you know, creating the space for these conversations, right? So thank you. Absolutely. Take care. Take All right. care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.